Brian walked out, but yeah, Brian, I could have stayed there forever this morning too. Worship is just, I can't put it in words, Jerry. It's awesome. Just to spend time corporately in the presence of the Lord. Whew. So I can say is, whew. Hey, good to see you, sis. God bless you. Nathan, where are you? Um, did you put last Sunday up yet? It'll be up tonight. I didn't get this come out yesterday. This week's will be up by Tuesday, though, right? If you did not, if you weren't here last week, was anybody not here last week? I, I would encourage you to take a half hour, go to YouTube, and punch in Mid Hudson Christian Church. And what was the date last Sunday? End of January? Last Sunday in January. And listen to it, because it's going to be kind of an ongoing thing here. I'm still, I'm still partially in worship. I'm still partly in that spoken word. And I'm like, I feel like weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. <laughs> so last week I talked about <clears throat> a little bit about history. I said, as a pastor, I can pray for you for anointing, for healing, to get set free. But one thing that I cannot impart to you and to your life is my history. My history is my history. Your history is your history. I'm going to start this morning by a quote from one of my favorite authors, Mark Twain. He says, the two greatest days in your life the first one is the day you were born, and the second one is the day you discover why you were born. So I say that to challenge you, because I say quite often, and sometimes we say things so many times that it kind of goes over our heads, but do we really know that these are the days that we are born for right now. History is being made right now, and you're at the center of your own history, each of you. Whether you want to believe that or accept that, at a young age, I had no clue about my history being made. <clears throat> but now I am so aware of it, and I'm actually excited about it. And I believe this year, 2018, is going to be such a profound year for history being made in the body of Christ as we go forth and break through and walk into the assignments that he set before us. I'm speaking slow so it kind of sinks in. Do you hear what I'm saying? In Acts chapter 2, there was 120 in the upper room. The Spirit of the Lord came and there was power released. Miracles happened and ensued. Peter, who, as we read earlier throughout his history, was a man that wasn't exactly eloquent in speech. Kind of actually had a bad case of hoof and mouth disease when he spoke. You know, you think back in when he was having a conversation with Jesus and the other disciples, and Jesus said, who do men say that I am? Remember that conversation? And they all said, had a comment, and Peter said, thou art the Christ, son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. 
So Peter had a revelatory moment of seeing in the unseen realm, if you will. But then he goes on to tell Jesus that he needs to stay there and build the kingdom of God here. And what did Jesus say to Peter? Get thee behind me, Satan. For you are not mindful of the things of God, you are mindful of the things of men. So this is the Peter we know and read about until the day of Pentecost when the power of the Holy Spirit fell. And authority came upon him power came upon him and he so eloquently spoke and why can I say that because in that very first day 3,000 got saved from Peter speaking filled with the Holy Spirit theologians said the days that ensued that there were up to 50,000 people that got gloriously saved from Pentecost and got filled with the Holy Spirit so the primary focus and purpose of the Holy Spirit is for power, empowerment. So here we have all these people in Jerusalem. And what is God telling them to do? The Lord is saying, go out. Make disciples of all nations. They wanted to just have their own little thing. They didn't want to go out. They just sat on their duffs. The apostles, the people, the church, they didn't, do, they didn't do what they were commanded to do. Go out and make nations. So the Lord in his mercy <clears throat> allowed, he didn't sponsor it, he didn't create it, but he allowed persecution to come because if you take people who have a task who have a commission who have an assignment and they're not doing that then the religious leaders the political leaders were getting stirred and when that starts to stir it releases a, a realm of the demonic and that's what was happening gosh does that sound like familiar history to anyone this was the start of the church. So when this happened, they, when the persecution came, they went out. And how did they go out? They went out as missionaries. And incredible miracles happened. Incredible miracles happened. Tongues, a fire, interpretation of tongues, miracles, healings, prophecy, Prophecy that would go into a meeting or a situation and release the power of God in the unseen realm to bring forth what's going to happen. Boy, do we need the prophetic. We need the prophetic. So what was the outpouring for? Miracles, healing, prophecy, tongues, interpretation of tongues, signs and wonders, prophetly speaks that changes present circumstances, releases the kingdom of God into impossible situations. That's what the power of the Holy Spirit does. The gifts of the Spirit are the manner for the manifestation of the power. But I want to speak to you this morning about a second purpose of the Holy Spirit that perhaps we don't think about often, but it's very real. That second purpose of the Holy Spirit is what I'm gonna call the fruit, found in Galatians. Can anybody recite to me the gifts of the fruit of the Spirit? Peace, joy, all of those things, they produce one word. There's one word I'm looking for. Endurance. You see, the second part of the Holy Spirit that produces the first, the fruit, produces the fruit, releases endurance. You see, we have to have endurance for it's endurance that keeps us and holds us together. 
when we're waiting for the breakthrough of the supernatural that has not yet come. I spoke a few weeks ago about the BAM. We all love the BAM moment. Remember the BAM? But sometimes it's a slow burn. Sometimes we don't see it right away and we get discouraged. That's where the fruit of the Spirit must engage. You understand. As a farmer, I appreciate and understand the seasons. Sweet corn for human consumption, from the time it goes in the ground until it can go on your table, is somewhere from 60 to 90 days. Cow corn, field corn, somewhere about 190, 80 to 90 days. Oats, 90 to 95 days. Wheat, about the same. Soybeans, red kidney beans, I can go on and on and on because I know every season, I know when they're supposed to be in the ground, and I know pretty much when they're supposed to be harvested. Speaking of seasons, but then the fruit, the fruit. My grandfather in the 40s retired from Norwich, New York to Ithaca where I was born and raised. He was a fourth generation dairy farmer. He retired on a farm in Ithaca, and my dad farmed his land, but my grandfather, a retired dairy farmer, and he still was blacksmithing at the time, had a huge barn he did his blacksmith work in, he kept about 10 acres of the land and didn't allow my dad to farm that because that was gonna be his orchard. And so sometimes in the early 40s, he planted, you get about, in New York State, you can get about 300 apple trees per acre, okay? Just to give you an idea. Other states is a little bit more, but on the average in New York State, you get about 100 apple trees per acre, or 300 apple trees per acre. And he blotted out about 10 acres, but he had cherry trees, he had pear trees, and he had the most beautiful orchard. And my grandfather was at the age of his life where he appreciated the fruit. And God showed me this picture this last summer while I was laying in my chair with many days to ponder life. <laughs> and my, my grandfather died in 19, January 27th, 1969. I know because I took the phone call from the nursing home. I was about 4.30 in the morning and they had called and I was just ready to walk out to the door and go into the barn and start doing chores. Dad was already out there milking cows. And I had to go to my dad and tell him, Dad, your father just died. I'll, I'll never forget it. He didn't stop milking cows. He was in the middle of milking. He continued, he put his head down. I saw the tears run down his face. We hugged, and I went out and did my chores. That was life on the farm. But my grandfather gave his heart to the Lord the last 10 years of his life, and he was so proud of his orchards. See, I just gave you the dates for how quickly you can get sweet corn to put on your table 60 to 90 days. And I've told you the stories of my father's abundance in all of his harvests, that his yielding of corn, wheat, or oats, whatever it is, was off the charts. He literally, many times in harvest season, would have to take some of the grain to market because his barns were overflowing and didn't have room to hold it. True story. But that's how God blessed my parents that walked in the ways of God. And it was such a clear life lesson to me as I got older and saw that. So my grandfather had this orchard. And I was, as I got older, he, he, he what's it called when you separate a piece of land? Subdivided. Subdivided my grandfather's house and the orchard and my dad wanted, because it was four or 500 acres on that plot. 
My dad wanted the farmland. It, as the only son, it was his inheritance. And I really wanted my grandfather's house, but I was only 13. <laughs> that wasn't going to happen. I was the oldest son. In fact, dad didn't even come to me and ask me, hey, son, you want your grandpa's house? No. Nope. Because across the, the highway from my grandfather's property, there was another old farmer that my dad knew for years, and he had just recently passed within a month of my grandfather. So that came up for sale. So my dad took the money from my grandfather's house and bought another 400 acres of my neighbor's property. And that's what you do. Because the most important thing to a farmer, the crop farmer, is the real estate. The crops in the field. You've heard me talk about this. Where am I going with this? You'll see. So that was my father's mindset, was for crops. He was building the farm. My grandfather was in a different mode because he was a bit older. He was grooming his orchard. Do you know the average apple tree? It's five years before it can really yield a harvest, unlike the 90 days of sweet corn. <laughs> so there's a difference between fruit and gifts. You feel following me? You follow me here? Fruit needs to be developed. There's more time put aside. So many times we want the BAMs. Well, this last summer I didn't have the BAM. I mean, I got the BAM that I was still alive. <laughs> that was miraculous. But the process of working it through, not so much. When I was in that season, the Lord took me to Psalm 23. And I had to declare, and I think that what I want to share with you this morning, there's, there's, I shared with you a few weeks ago, Psalm 16. Remember when I shared that with you and broke it down? I think we need to learn to allow the Word of God to speak to us and declare it like that over our lives. Last summer was an interesting season of my life. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I declared that in that season. Lord, you're my pastor. The shepherd is the pastor. The Lord is my pastor, I shall not want. I declared I shall not want. I had to declare that out of my spirit in that time of endurance because it wasn't a quick thing that I was back to, I wanted to be back to work, I wanted to be back to the church, believe you me. Ask my wife, she'll tell you. We have to learn how to declare his promises over our life during those seasons of endurance. So as you read the, the, the 23rd Psalm, he makes me to lead, lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. I had to come to a place that I said, I shall not want. I am rich in you. I'm rich in you. I could not see into the unseen realm, but I knew that King David in his writings, that the Psalms would take me to that place if I stayed there and dwelt. You know, I'm a firm believer than this, that nothing will give Satan the bloody nose quicker than you being in an impossible situation and say, I shall not want. And that was mine. If you sit and have a conversation with my wife, part of that time for me seemed in the natural like it was never gonna end. Because for a workaholic to be stuck in a chair, the same chair, in the same room, in the same window, day in and day out and day in, I never had a sabbatical in my life. I was going all the time, Lou, you know what that's like. The hardest thing for a workaholic to do is sit. So many times when God is working deeply within us, we don't get it. Sometimes it takes months. Sometimes it takes years 
per, it starts to unfold. The Lord is starting to unfold last summer to me, just glimpses. Bold faith. I wrote some notes in that time, and I just transferred them over this week into my notes, preaching notes from my journal. Bold faith stands on the shoulders of quiet truths, quiet trusts from the time of endurance in our life. Let me read that to you again. Bold faith stands on the shoulders of times of quiet trust and quiet truth from endurance. I've always been a guy that has asked God for bold faith. Since I was a young man, I've admired men like Smith Wigglesworth. I've just, Father, drop that into my heart and in my spirit. I want what that man has. <clears throat> there were some days this seemed dark, not cold. There's a difference, and I'm going to tell you about that. It was latter July of that year that I got my news from my other sisters that my sister Peggy, who had been suffering with soy scardosis for 25 years, was really close. So we, I would call her every two days. I talked to her two days before she died, July 27th of last year. And she said, Stevie, don't you call me Stevie. It's my time, but it's not yours. And she started to speak prophetically to me. And I just listened, and we cried together. I wasn't there yet, you know? I wasn't able to function, to go out and see her, do any travel. That wasn't, wasn't on the plan. Couldn't do it. And there was a time. It seemed dark in those, t in those days for me. But I say to you, it wasn't a cold dark. There's a, there's a darkness that can come over our lives and it's cold. And that's usually brought on by something that's a bit off in our lives. Cold darkness is not good. This was a darkness that I didn't understand. But the Lord allowed me to open my eyes and see. Psalm 23, verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow, the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. The day after her death, it felt really dark. And the Lord sovereignly spoke to my spirit. And he said, son, the darkness is see." you see, is my shadow. It's my shadow, because that's how close I am to you right now. That forever changed me. Immediately, he gave me Psalm 51, 57, verse 1. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for my soul trusts in you. And in the shadow of your wings, I will take my refuge until these calamities have passed me by. There's a place in God, people of God, that we need to understand the seasons of life that we're in. I want to read you something. I'm going to read you Psalm 23. Tom and Deb gave me for Christmas the Passion Bible. Whew. I would encourage you, if you're doing a word study, to sometimes go to the Passion Bible. Just Google it and look it up. Let me read you Psalm 23. <laughs> the Lord is my best friend and my shepherd. I always have more than enough. 
He offers a resting place for me in his luxurious love. His tracks take me to an innate oasis of his peace, the quiet brook of bliss. That's where he restores and revives my life. He opens before me pathways to God's pleasure and leads me along his, in his footsteps of righteousness so that I can bring honor to his name. Lord, even when your path takes me through the valley of the deepest darkness, fear will never conquer me, for you already have. Poof. You hear that? You remain close to me and lead me through it all the way. Your authority is my strength and my peace. The comfort of your love takes away my fear. I'll never be lonely for you are near. You become my delicious feast. Even when my enemies dare to fight, you anoint me with the fragrance of your Holy Spirit. And you give me all I can drink until, a drink of until my heart overflows. So why would I fear the future? For your goodness and love pursue me all the days of my life. Then afterwards, when my life is through, I'll return to your glorious presence to be with you forever. Isn't that beautiful? It's like so poetic. Man, I wish I could write that way. <laughs> so when we talk about Pentecost, in the Holy Spirit, in the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit. There's so many different areas and ways that it touches our lives and reaches and ministers to us. You know, we need, we're at a place where we need to have the faith of God, not just in God, but to have the faith of God. And I believe that just comes in seasons that he leads us. Faith is either a fruit of the Spirit or a gift of the Spirit. Fruit grows with us using it and hearing it. Gifts are sudden installments of God's gifts of hearing and obedience. All measures can grow with his use. And then I wrote this, we all have to protect our peace. Our peace will protect our faith. Sometimes we get so busy, even in ministry, it pushes out the peace. We can have Mark 11 faith but we must have peace. The gift of faith never goes unanswered. It says the prayer of faith heals the sick, and it'll never change. It'll never change. I want to interject something to you. I had you read as a homework assignment was it two weeks ago, Amanda? Isaiah 54, anybody remember that? Yes? Where is it? Well, down in verse four, it says, this is, I was talking about this because I wanted you to get a picture of how God wants to enlarge us. This talks about, um, enlarge the place in your tent, enlarge the place in your heart, and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwelling and do not spare lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you, you will expand to the right and to the left and your descendants will inherit the nations and make desolate cities inhabited. Do not fear for you will not be ashamed. Neither be disgraced for you will not be put to shame. For you will forget the shame of your youth. I have a lot of shame in my youth that the Lord has removed. A lot of that shame came from an unhealthy fear. And I want to talk to you in the moment, this moment, moment for, about fear. I was 12 years old and I wanted to climb our silo, our highest silo. It was 82 feet in the air. And dad said, you can do it after you finish chores. I can do it solo by myself. Yup, you can. But don't ask me to come get you, take you down. You go up, you come down alone. I was so stoked. I finished chores early, I was up there, I, was up, I got up there before it was dark. 
I got up to the top and it was the most amazing thing. It seems like you could just see for miles. There's this metal ring around the top. It's fiberglass, so it's slippery. You gotta be careful. If it's wet, he wouldn't have let me done it. So I got up there and I hung out and like Nate said, man, I thought it was it. I was the man at 12. I've conquered the hill. I'm on top of the silo. But then it's time to go down. Six o'clock, seven o'clock. I see my mom walking from the barn to the house. Hey, mom! She turns around, she's looking. Up here! Stevie, what are you doing on top of that? Stevie, once again, only family. Sorry, your family, but blood family. So, I was, because when you, when the top is a pitched top, and then it's flat for like four feet, where the, where the hatch is, where you go down the side. You don't want to go down the side because this was empty. That's a long drop. So, the only way up is the way, the only way down is the way you came up. So you got this ladder, and there is a cage around the ladder. So, I mean, my body would fall through that cage because they were big, pretty big openings. So I, and then the wind started to blow. <laughs> and it was dark. And, and mom went in and got dad. And dad came back outside and said, I told you, I'm not gonna yell. He says, I told you if you're going up, you're coming down. I'm not coming after you. I was up there for three and a half hours. <laughs> yeah, that was a life lesson in my history. And I came down and I was shaking the whole way down. And then the following year, the only sport I could go out for on the farm was wrestling because it was after harvest season, it was during the winter months. And so I was a wrestler and I was a good wrestler. So after meets, a lot of times, the bus would drop me off at a, at a nearby row, which is like three miles from the house. And I didn't like dark after that subtle thing. I just had a real problem with the dark. I'm just being honest with you. I mean, fear gripped me. I mean, it gripped me. And uh, I was really fearful of the dark. So I was walking home this one night and it was winter and it was cold and it was pitch black. And man, if you think the woods doesn't talk, it does. <laughs> yeah, I'm in the road and I couldn't run fast enough. I mean, Forrest Gump couldn't hold a candle to me that night, man. I was hoofing it home. I, got, I, I walked in the house and I was so winded. Mom says, what's wrong? Nothing, <laughs> nothing. But I had to deal with fear. I carried that fear until I gave my heart to the Lord when I was eight. I backslid through my teenage years and rededicated my life around the time, three years before I met March. Got filled with the Holy Spirit. I carried it until that time. So my teenage years, I dealt with some serious fear. And that fear used to bring depression because I'm the oldest son, I'm a big guy, I'm, I'm, I'm everybody in my class, I, they come up to here and I was, you know, because I was tall, right? Tyler, for you know what I'm talking about, you know, the tallest in the class and kids look up to you like, you're the man. But I was a fearful man, but nobody knew it and I couldn't let them know it. So I had this demon inside me that I carried a fear and it was demonic. I remember being in sleep one night in bed, and I, <clears throat> my little brother, five years apart, I had to sleep on the top bunk because my, bro, my mom said, he's too young to sleep on the top. I don't want him rolling out and hitting his head on the floor. I had, so that was up to me. <laughs> I guess I was more resilient or bouncy. I don't know. So I woke up one night in the middle of the night, two o'clock in the morning, and I, I, there was no curtains on those windows at that point in our room because they had just finished it. And I looked out the, the windows about those size over there, and there was a guy out there looking at me, two o'clock in the morning. I was positive of it. I never screamed so loud in my life, Brianna. I screamed, I cried like a little whiny. My bedroom was off the kitchen, and all the other four bedrooms are at the other end of the house, and I woke everybody up in the house, including my dad, who's deaf. I was screaming so loud, and they came running. 
Can't you see him? He's right there. Stunned there's nobody there. Go back to bed. <laughs> this is, you know, I, I understand torment and fear. And this last summer, for a moment, for a moment, when I was in that darkness after my sister died and I was sitting in that chair alone, I had a vision of that. And I proclaimed Psalm 23. And like that, it was gone. You understand the power of the word I'm talking about? There's something about the power that once we make it ours, and it's in us, ingrained in the very fiber of our being, no matter what you face, what calamity you're up against, no matter how dark it looks, or how bad it is, or how depressed you get, if you start to develop the history with God, because as I said, the two days greatest days in your life, the day you got born, and then the second one is what? Understanding why you were born, that's when your history starts. We all have to have our own history. I said last week, when we understand it, then we can make history with God. And that's my prayer for breakthrough through each and every one of us this year, is that we all can start to make our own history with God in a real, real powerful way that's significant. Because everyone's history is significant. Everyone's history has the potential to impact nations. How do you know you're not the Neth Billy Graham or Smith Wigglesworth? How do you know? I don't care whose shadow you've been in or you think you've been in up until now, and I don't care if you're 15, 25, or 75. It does not matter, and it's never too late to start your own history. That's today's lesson. Start your history with God and learn to make history with him. Are you with me? There's certain scriptures that in my life have just been a watering hole to me. One of them that I'm going to read to you again in the Passion from Psalm 25, to verse 12 through 15. But one question still remains. How do I live in the holy fear of God? Show me the right path to take. Then prosperity and favor will be my portion. And my descendants will inherit all that is good. There's a private place reserved for the lovers of God where they will sit near him and receive the revelation secrets of his promises. Wow, let me read that one back to you. There's a private place reserved for the lovers of God where they will sit near him and receive the revelation secrets of his promises. Rescue me, O Lord, for you're my only hero. Whew. That just sends chills up my spine. There is power that's transformed as it goes through our spirit and comes off the tongue in our times of endurance. I told you the other week, it's not reciting it and memorizing it. It's knowing it because you have a history with him and you're making that history real. And then his word can come alive in you. And in that time of endurance, in that time of calamity, in that time, whatever you're up against, I don't care what it is, the thing that's gonna roll off your tongue, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Doesn't Joel 3, 7 say, the last portion of that, let the weak say, I am strong? Don't allow the enemy anymore to speak to you because he's not the one who saved you. Don't give him any credit. Don't give him the attention. He doesn't deserve it. And you know what I speak this morning. The Lord had me share this word because there's some of you, like myself, that still have to deal 
with the thoughts that come in, whether they're fear, whether they're depression, whether they're anger, whatever they are, like that. When we declare the spoken word that's in here and allowed to come out, we'll change the situation. For there the Lord demands his blessing on life forevermore. I have so many more pages, but I'm going to stop there. The bottom line is this. God wants to increase the demonstration of his healing power to us, his people. That's the bottom line. These are the days we were born for. These are the days for us to start making history with God. And you're just as much a part of it, if not more so than I am. Don't think it's only for the clergy. Don't buy that lie. <clears throat> the people that impacted my life the most were people like my grandma, who bounced me on her knee at five years old and told me what I was going to do. She prophesied my life. She said, Stevie, there it goes again. <laughs> You're going to be a missionary to the nations. I think of it every time I get on the airplane to the Ukraine. And I give God the glory. Would you stand to your feet with me? Father, we are so grateful that you showed us the path of life and plenty of joy in your presence too and delightful things are at your right hand and I know I know no good without you that's a song Father may that become a living reality to us this morning the goodness of your presence the goodness of your love the goodness of your power And I release right now an anointing of deliverance for those that need a touch from you this morning. We're going to take communion, but first I want to pray for some people.